Uh, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to um, be with you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I'm going to assume you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I am speaking to you from the Adelaide Hills. So I would like to start with an acknowledgement, which I'm in the habit of doing. I live uh, somewhere called Aldgay in the Adelaide Hills, which is on the traditional lands of the Paramank people. So I like to say at the beginning of the talk that I acknowledge and pay my respects to the Paramank people, the original inhabitants of the Adelaide Hills, and recognize their ongoing connection with this land, which was never ceded. Okay, having said that, what is uh, someone who spent most of their adult life training bankers doing talking to you about modern monetary theory and ecological economics. I, I, perhaps I should give a little bit of background. Um, when thinking about uh, the future and about the ecological challenges that we face in this generation and the generations to come, you can fall into two traps, I think. One potential trap, which I'm prone to myself, is catastrophism. And just thinking that whatever we do is not going to be enough to avoid uh, uh, a series of crises which are going to undermine um, uh, our economies and, and, and modern societies with uh, goodness knows what consequences. And that's one extreme and it can become an irrational viewpoint that you can take. But on the other side, there's the equally, equally irrational view, which is extreme optimism. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, we're going to transition to a clean, green economy over the next decade or couple of decades. Uh, we'll get to net zero by 2050, and that's all that we need to do. Technology will save us, all that kind of thing. I would like to start then by um, saying one optimistic thing and one pessimistic thing. The optimistic thing that I have to say is that, in my view, based on a dispassionate at least from my perspective, reading of the evidence, um, it's not too late. We can build uh, future economies which are consistent with maintaining and improving the quality of life of hundreds of millions, billions of people over time uh, while uh, defending and restoring the natural environment within which we live and of which we're a part. That's the optimistic statement. The pessimistic statement, we can't do this if our economic narrative remains dominated in the future as it has been to a greater or lesser extent in various forms for the last hundred years by a neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics has always been misleading and we've now reached a point in our history where it's not just misleading, it's an existential threat. I've thought this for oh, probably at least 10 years, partly because my closest economics friend and colleague in Adelaide, um, Phil Lorne, is Australia's leading ecological economist. And uh, about five years ago, the two of us got together and you, know, you think, what could we do to, in a small way, make a difference on this planet? And we decided to try and put together a set of postgraduate qualifications, because after all, we're teachers. Um, in heterodox economics, but uh, centered on the two elements in non neoclassical economics, which we think are most important. If we are going to, um, if only we can uh, uh, gain influence in the next five or 10 years in policy institutions around the world to deliver uh, a sustainable future economy. Um, with uh, improved living standards for all. And those two elements were modern monetary theory, and I think of myself as an MMT economist, although that's not really what I'm gonna be talking about today, and ecological economics, which is Phil's area of expertise. We spent the next couple of years trying to uh, interest universities in doing this and in Australia. And we could, couldn't, for a long time, we couldn't find any takers, particularly because um, if you go to a university that has an economics department, it's invariably a department dominated by neoclassical economists, 
and they are simply not interested in 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 offering what we thought was was important because we we really need a production line of economists trained in MMT who understand ecological issues. That's so important. So in the end, a couple of years ago, uh, we quit our jobs and we set up a charity called Modern Money Lab, which you can see the name of in the top left hand corner there in Adelaide. And eventually we found a university. It's the newest university in Australia. It has to be one of the two private unis in Australia. None of the public unis were interested, called Torrance University. And we are launching our postgraduate courses, including a master's degree in the economics of sustainability, which is really in MMT and ecological economics in a couple of weeks time. Um, the abstract that I gave the organizers for this event is very similar to the first note that I wrote to the vice chancellor at Torrens University. Uh, 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 maybe I will just very quickly read through it with you. Living within planetary boundaries is central to the pursuit of sustainable well-being. If we are to do this in time to preserve a stable environment, we need policymakers to admit the scale of the challenges we face and to be informed by competent economic analysis. Both Phil and I believe, and this is not the same thing as saying necessarily that real gross domestic product has to fall, but both of us believe that we must abandon the objective of perpetual growth, focus on our real resource and ecological constraints, and not be distracted by neoclassical myths relating to the monetary system, the appropriate functions of government, or the economics of climate change. And we both believe passionately that insights derived from modern monetary theory and ecological economics are essential tools if we're to meet the challenges of this century with confidence. So with the help of lecturers and subject writers like Dirk Entz, who is there with you, and Scott Fulweiler, who many of you will have heard of, and others too, and with the advice of Stephanie Kelterman and Fadel Kaboob, that's exactly what we've been spending our time doing for the last couple of years. I guess most, if not all of us, have had a training in neoclassical economics. And I even taught it for oh, 20 years after, after I graduated. And I'm embarrassed now by some of what I used to teach, what I used to inculcate into, into people's minds. You remember, I'm sure, that the neoclassical approach is based on a, the, an explicit or implicit general equilibrium model centered on individuals with impossible access to information and cognitive capacity and with the power to make decisions which maximize their well-being. So based on preferences which are not influenced by other people and which they, they uh, um, very well understand, they're able to decide how much to work and how much leisure time to take now and when they work the pay they get depends on their marginal productivity which in turn depends on how much they have invested in their human capital in the past and they make rational decisions able to look into the future with almost perfect foresight about how much to borrow and now pay back later or save now. We know that in New Keynesian economics, they have a form of monopolistic competition so that they can have price setting, but basically the default market model, which is what is in the back of everybody's mind the whole time, is perfect competition with any deviations from this treated as market failures. And if they think about ecological issues at all, if they think about, for example, carbon dioxide emissions at all, they see them as a negative externality Given all their other assumptions, it's possible to look into the future to identify precisely the social costs of those negative externalities and identify an optimal tax. And if you internalize the externality by uh, uh, implementing an optimal tax, then in theory, there are substitutions in consumption and in production processes, and there are technological changes, which means that you get an ideal or at least a Pareto optimal allocation of resources, and the economy can continue to grow forever. And there is no issue about the scale of our impact on the environment within which we live and of which we are a part. Um, I couldn't help but put the cartoon on the left-hand side on this slide. 
This is a magical world of preposterous assumptions. It has always stood in the way of maximizing the well being of hundreds of millions of people. Um, it's always led to inequality, financial instability, and crisis. Um, but now it's a threat to our survival, or at least the survival of our civilizations. So we need an alternative um, set of economic foundations. And what's more, and this is the difficult thing, as far as I'm concerned, we need social tipping points, political tipping points to, to, to occur before ecological ones do, because we need these foundations to be incorporated in the way that real world politicians, treasuries, central banks, other institutions make decisions. The most important elements, not the only elements, but the most important elements in this new economics are modern monetary theory and ecological economics. And I'll level with you. Uh, I, five to 10 years ago, um, sometimes felt that there was an ecological problem with MMT. That MMT was too often seen by people as an efficient way of growing economies faster. Um, I don't think that anymore. I think that the work of, well, let's mention Steve Keane and Dirk Enns, who are with you, amongst many other people, and Fadel Kaboob, but especially Stephanie Kelton, has pulled modern monetary theory towards ecological economics over time. And in many respects, um, if you compare the great popularizing book of MMT, The Deficit Myth, with the great popularizing book of recent years for ecological economics, which is Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. There are very major similarities between those two books when you put them side by side and you read them. And the quote you can see in the bottom left-hand corner of this screen, a just and more prosperous world, one that combines ecological sustainability with full employment, human well-being, a lower degree of inequality, and excellent public services that meets the needs of all is within reach. Now that could come from either of these books. It actually comes from Stephanie's book. But we have been dragging MMT and ecological economics together. I like to think that a conference we held in Adelaide at the beginning of 2020, where we had Stephanie Kelton and Bill Mitchell, but we had very well-known ecological economics, not just economists, not just Bill, but Robert Costanzo and Mark Diesendorf and others as well, might have played a small part in this. So if MMT and ecological economics are so important, and if, I, if they're going to be at the center of the master's degree, which we're just having our first intake for in a few weeks time, um, what are the main elements? What are the core elements of these two schools of thought? I hardly need to talk to you about the MMT column here. We all know who the main figures have been in building the foundations of modern monetary theory. Yes, on the shoulders of previous generations of economists like Abba Lerner and Wynne Godley and Hyman Minsky. Um, but the big four, I always think, are Warren Mosler and Bill Mitchell and Randall Ray and Stephanie Kelton. She's not just a popularizer of MMT, but as Stephanie Bell, um, she wrote a couple of early papers which are very important in the foundations of modern monetary theory. So you know perfectly well that modern monetary theory, when you think about it in a descriptive sense, is about the monetary system. Um, the distinction between currency issuers and currency users is of vital importance. Understanding the determinants and the significance of monetary sovereignty is important too. We all know you're a monetary sovereign. If you issue the currency that you collect taxes, in if that currency is not convertible into any commodity or foreign currency that you could run out of at a fixed rate. And if you have no significant foreign currency denominated debt, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the essentials. We know if you are a monetary sovereign, you face real constraints, of course you do, but you face no purely financial ones. You're not gonna run out of your own currency. We all know that. We also, know about when Godley's sectoral balances approach to macroeconomics. We know that if at full employment, the non-government part 
of the monetary system, um, desires to accumulate net financial assets, then it's vital that the currency issuing government runs a definite deficit in order to supply those financial assets and support the economy. That's a descriptive side of MMT. We also know MMT has a prescriptive side. We often talk about the aim of maintaining non-inflationary full employment, which is one way of helping to create more equitable distribution of income, but that's not the only reason full employment is important. Uh, we know that a federal job guarantee will do that as well as helping to stabilize the economy across the economic cycle. And we often talk about the use of monetary sovereignty to pursue something called the public purpose. Although we don't always specify in detail what the public purpose is. Well, that's MMT. What's ecological economics all about? And I, 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 perhaps before I go on, I, I, I'd like us to be able to stop using the term MMT and just call that left-hand column macroeconomics. I would like to stop using um, the term ecological economics in the right-hand corner. We all should be ecological economists and just say, well, this is what we think about at the beginning of Econ 101. This is where we start from. We don't start from here, do we? But we should. Ecological economics was developed by Kenneth Balding. He deserves a mention. There is a brilliant essay. Please look this up online and read it if you never have done that. He wrote in 1966 called The Economics of the Coming Spaceship Earth, which is really about the implications of the human impact on our environment exceeding the biocapacity of that environment to uh, absorb <coughs> our waste and allow us to draw resources from it without deteriorating over time. Um, but the other founders of ecological economics, Nicholas Georgescu Rogan, you may have heard of, and his student, Herman Daly, who I'm gonna mention in a moment. Kate Roweth, as I said, is the modern, very, very effective uh, popularizer of ecological economics. If you haven't read Donut Economics, please read it. So the descriptive part, the economy is, well, it sits within society, of course, and society is a subset of the biosphere. So given that our biosphere is limited, we have planetary boundaries that we need to live within if we are going to retain a stable and livable environment then we have to concern ourselves with our impact on that environment, with our ecological footprint. What's the prescriptive part of ecological economics? Um, they don't always talk about equality first, but radically lower levels of inequality in most countries are always, almost always, an issue at the forefront of the minds and discussions of ecological economists. Ecological sustainability, we're going to come back to that, of course. They often talk about efficiency. I prefer to use the word effectiveness because that word efficiency has sort of almost been stolen from us by neoclassical economists. Um, when we talk about effectiveness, you know, if we've got limited ecological resources, we have to use them effectively to maximize the well being of the present generation without threatening the well being of generations to come. So, what does this lead to? It leads you to thinking about quantitative cumulative limits not just on carbon dioxide emissions, but uh, for any scarce ecological resources. We should be rethinking what we value. Does it make sense to talk as though maximizing the growth in something called real GDP is our overwhelming objective? We, yes, we need to rethink distribution as I was kind of just talking about. Um, this does involve as MMT sort of implies, I think, a much greater role for governments and for public investments. Of course it does, and regulations, and ecological economists often talk about cap and trade, because if you want to strictly limit carbon emissions, you need some way of actually ensuring that you're, you're going to do that. Uh, there are, of course, political problems, and existing cap and trade schemes are far from uh, ideal. And there may be alternatives like a uh, carbon currency um, that some of you may have heard of as well to uh, ensure that we don't continue to indefinitely to uh, uh, produce net emissions of carbon dioxide, which will increase 
the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere and drive us towards more and more crises. So what should be the public purpose? On oh, remember, Spaceship Earth. Uh, I don't need to read all these things again, I'm more or less repeating myself, but much of what is on this slide would be shared by almost all MMT economists and as well as almost all ecological economists. If you want to use the word degrow, fine, but I prefer to be agnostic in two respects where gross domestic product is concerned. If gross domestic product can grow while you are living within your planetary boundaries, that's fine. Um, I am not going to a priori say that we need to massively scale back on GDP around the world or gross world product, although I am extremely, um, what's the word, sceptical about the potential for long run economic growth. I mean, it's just, it's just the arithmetic. It's enough to do that, really. If you imagine growing the world economy at 3% per annum, for 200 years, a bit more than 200 years, you'd have an economy a thousand times bigger than the one at the moment. That is just not going to happen. At some stage, the global economy is going to stop growing in terms of GDP. But I'm, I'm agnostic about GDP in another sense too. We need to change the way we organize um, our economies, the management of our economies. We need to rethink what and how we produce and consume we need to grow some things and degrow others. And when we're talking about that GDP statistic, we need to build an economy where people's well-being will be maintained, whether gross domestic product rises or not. None of any of this is meaningful if we don't have a healthy biosphere, if we don't have a healthy planet to live on, if your house is burnt down or is under the water. Maintaining and improving human well-being requires a fundamental change in, in the way in which we see the environment, which is not something separate to ourselves. It is something of which we are a part and on which we depend. So we need to get ourselves off the global growth machine. And the global growth machine has been absolutely amazing, particularly during the great acceleration since the year 1950. Now, of course, 1950 to 1975, that was sort of good Keynesianism, wasn't it? Enormous growth, especially in high income countries where the benefits were widely shared. But you can see what happened as far as the scale of global economic activity, it should be called gross world product really, is concerned. We've had an enormous expansion in the global economy over the last 70 years. And it's done great things. It has lifted, or it's helped to lift, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty to give people uh, a, a quality of life which previous generations couldn't have even dreamt of and all the modern technology that goes along with it as well. I would, however, just briefly suggest that, well, first of all, the, the benefits of this growth have gone disproportionately to the global north, US, Australia, Japan, and Western Europe. Of course they have. It's been built on extracting renewable and non-renewable resources from the planet, and particularly on the use of fossil fuels to power our economy. So we're, we're the ones that are responsible historically for the carbon dioxide emissions, which have put us in the position we are now. And most importantly, I think there is reasonably clear evidence that once you get on a per capita basis to about the size of the Estonian economy, there's no statistically significant benefit to going beyond that. In high income countries, it's not that the economy isn't big enough to provide everybody with a good quality of life. The issue is about distribution, not the scale of economic activity. And you can, you can see this using all sorts of metrics. I just took this particular one. It's not the best one, but it happened to be convenient because it was on my computer. If you look at subjective life satisfaction against GDP per capita, and you restrict yourself to countries with a GDP per capita above that of Estonia, you find there's no statistically significant relationship. Now, if I put a line of best fit through that chart on the right, it would be marginally upward sloping. But as I said, it's not statistically significant. And there have been some other years if I wanted to cheat 
2015-16, where it would have slowed downwards, actually. Um, that's also true if you're talking about um, uh, uh, life expectancy, if you're talking about crime rates, if you're talking about a wide variety of metrics of what it means to have a successful society. Once you get beyond the income per head of about Estonia, higher income doesn't seem to do very much for you. On the other hand, it is always the case when we're looking at these metrics of what it means to have a successful society, uh, homelessness, for example, that's another one. It's always the case that lower inequality and a more successful society go together. So it seems that in lower income countries, growth in GDP really matters in terms of improving the quality of people's lives. But in the rich world, and it's the rich world that's living unsustainably at the moment, there really isn't evidence, in my view, that that's the case at all. Remember, at the moment, I'm trying to stay agnostic on growth. Okay, then let's go back to the beginning of Econ 101. Uh, what's the first diagram you had in your introductory economics course? It was probably a production possibility frontier. You remember that one? It shouldn't have been a production possibility frontier because that production possibility frontier leaves the natural world of which we're a part and on which we depend out. It should have been something like this chart which is taken from Professor Pas pa uh, Dasgupta's uh, um, 2021 report for the UK Treasury. As we were saying, the economy is a subset of the biosphere. The biosphere, at least as far as material is concerned, is a effectively a closed system. Nothing gets in or out, or virtually nothing gets in or out. As far as energy is concerned, it takes in energy from the sun, of course, and emits uh, waste heat into near space. Our economy involves us extracting from the biosphere renewable and non-renewable resources, energy to produce goods and services, which as we consume them, provide us with well-being, use value, but then we have used up those goods and services or they have depreciated and we return them or their constituent parts anyway as waste to the natural environment, to the biosphere. Now, this graph already suggests that there is potentially a problem as the economy expands relative to the biosphere. I know that's a little bit oversimplistic, but let's go with it for the moment. If we, uh, if we, oh, hang on, sorry, I'm having a few issues here. If we, um, if we extract too many, renewable and non-renewable resources, if we emit too many wastes, then the biosphere, our natural capital on which we depend will deteriorate over time. And that will eventually have implications for what is possible for us to do within the economy and of course for um, societies themselves. Bearing all this in mind, Let's go back to um, one of the founders of ecological economics, Herman Daly. If you want to learn about him, there was either last year or at the beginning of this year, there was a really good intellectual biography of him published by uh, another well-known ecological economist, Peter Victor, um, Herman Daly's Economics for a Full World. Well, what Herman Daly said back in the 1970s is that uh, if on Spaceship Earth we want to um, live sustainably. We don't want to, you know, when, when governments deficit spend, they're not borrowing from future generations. But when we live beyond our biocapacity, we are, in a sense. If we don't want to do that, then we must emit waste at a rate which does not exceed the absorptive capacity of the environment. That means, as far as carbon dioxide emissions are concerned, we need to move very rapidly, well before 2050, to zero net emissions. We need to use renewables at a rate which does not exceed the rate at which they can be renewed. Clearly, um, you can't cut down old growth forests without there being some impact on your well-being in the future and the well-being of the natural environment. You can't catch all the fish in the sea. Um, and thirdly, use non-renewables at a rate which does not exceed the rate at which, well, either you can discover 
other non-renewables to, to do the same thing or at which renewable substitutes can be adopted. And there is potentially a problem with the rapid electrification of our economy and moving rapidly towards 100% renewables because of the material footprint of doing that, because of the construction which will be necessary in order to allow that to take place quickly. But we'll come back to that in a few moments. Everybody loves the idea of a circular economy, the right to repair, recycling, and governments, yes, governments should use investments, public ownership, uh, uh, regulation, taxes, and subsidies to promote as rapid a transition to a far more circular economy than we are doing at the moment. And the same thing is true of regenerative agriculture. But the term circular economy is to an extent a misnomer because you can never have 100% recycling. There will always be some waste. Economic activity will always, to an extent, be linear. It will always involve, to an extent, taking in nutrients from the environment, using them, and then uh, uh, and them ending up being waste matter or, or heat. So there will always be environmental limits. There are two main approaches which have been taken scientifically to identify the environmental limits on our impact on the planet. One is one you, you might be familiar with, familiar with from the Earth System scientists at the Global Footprint Network, where they have devised a way of attempting to identify for individual countries and for the whole planet, the bio capacity, the capacity of the planet to, as, I, as I've just mentioned, provide those resources which we're extracting from it, absorb the waste which we are producing without our natural capital deteriorating over time. Um, a book which you can read to learn about how this is done is in a couple of slides time. So I'll refer to it when we, when we get to it. But an interesting thing from my perspective uh, about uh, this chart that you can see on the right hand side here is that it identifies that we were using up uh, our biocapacity on a global basis in around the year 1970. So prior to 1970, economic activity could locally cause the um, uh, deterioration and collapse of ecosystems. But on a global level, the planet was able to sustain our impact on it until about 1970. <clears throat> Since then, we've had an ecological deficit and you're probably familiar with Earth Overshoot Day that relates to this chart. It's now the case that uh, according to these guys, we are using up about 1.75 planets worth of resources every year. We are not living consistently with Herman Daly's principles of sustainability. And of course, that's an issue. And we can't help but notice that that's coming back to bite us already. Another approach, which you might prefer to um, talking about environmental limits, was eventually popularized by Kate Rather's 2017 book, Donut Economics, which I've already mentioned, the planetary boundaries approach. Johan Rockström, Will Steffen, and others bit more than 10 years ago now, identified nine planetary boundaries, one of which was to do with greenhouse gases and, uh, and climate change, but only one of which, which we need, to, um, we need to respect. If we are going to deliver to your children and their children a safe, hospitable, planet on which they can enjoy at least the same level of well-being, if not a greater level of well-being than we're enjoying now. So there'll always be limits. Now, this is one of the problems with neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics was devised you know, around about 1870, 1870 to 1900. And certainly in 1870, there was basically no footprint at all from fossil fuels. They hadn't really got going. So there was a tiny human footprint on the planet relating to the biocapacity 
of the planet, ecological issues were essentially an irrelevance, at least at the global level, and they played no part in the development of neoclassical economics. Even in 1950, when the Great Acceleration started, according to the guys at the Global Footprint Network, the human footprint on the planet was only about 50% of planetary biocapacity. So if Keynes didn't spend a lot of time worrying about ecological issues, given that he died in 1946, we can forgive him because at a global level, uh, ecological issues were not, uh, you need to be very far-sighted anyway, to see, some people did, uh, to see ecological issues as a relevant constraint for economic activity. But then came the Great Acceleration. And what an acceleration it was and how naive we might have been not to expect this to have an impact on our natural environment over time. You can see again what happened to real GDP. Uh, basically, real GDP and primary energy use have been almost perfectly correlated with each other. There's very limited scope for relative decoupling where primary energy use is concerned, at least based on uh, evidence up until now. And of course, you see carbon dioxide uh, uh, concentrations increasing. The same thing is true of other greenhouse gases. And eventually, with a delay, which I won't worry about now, you see surface temperature rising as well. That's the great acceleration. And as people like Will Stefan would tell you, it's related to the transition from the Anthropocene to the, uh, from the Holocene, I should say, to the Anthropocene. It's the transition from a 10 to 12,000 year period of incredibly stable and um, friendly climate, climate conditions, the conditions which allowed for all human civilizations to develop and economic development to take place to a, a, a set of circumstances now where our natural environment and the climate uh, within which we have to live depends on our own activities. So it's 1970, we are using up, according to the people behind the Global Footprint um, Network. That's the book I recommend you read, Ecological Footprint by Mathis uh, Wackernagel and Bert Byers. It's a fascinating book. Um, that's when we reached our biocapacity. Uh, people often talk about living within your means. And as we know, if you're a monetary sovereign government, um, that, that means nothing to you as far as financial resources are concerned. We talk about real constraints in MMT. This is the ultimate real constraint, at least in the end. If you live perpetually beyond your biocapacity, then eventually your ability to produce goods and services, to maintain your quality of life, to maintain something like our modern societies is, is eroded. Decoupling is then a word that people use a lot. Why can't we continue to grow GDP, but at the same time reduce our ecological footprint? Well, we've been quite successful in relative decoupling. Ecological economists, they generally write it down in a much more complex form, but they rely on something often called the impact equation. You can see why it's called the impact equation from the top line here. Our impact on the biosphere, our ecological footprint, depends, yes, it depends on how many of us there are, and it depends on our level of economic activity per person, real GDP per person. It also depends on what you can call technology, if you like, but what is a, 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 a measure of our ecological impact per dollar of real GDP. And that technological variable, our impact per dollar, has fallen rapidly over the last 50 years. We've been very successful in reducing the resource, the resource intensity of economic activity. Over that 50 year period, just checking the time, over that 50 year period, um, the global population has a little bit more than doubled. I don't want to imply that rapid population growth in low income countries is the problem here. Certainly not the main problem because it is not in those countries where people are living unsustainably. Affluence, real GDP per person, has also increased globally by a factor of a little bit more than two. But our ecological impact only gone up by more, maybe 1.75 now. So there has been relative decoupling. In some countries, there's been some absolute decoupling, but globally, 
there's only been relative decoupling. This is true whether you are talking about the ecological footprint in aggregate or whether you are talking about carbon emissions. If you're talking about carbon emissions, there are some countries that have managed some degree, limited degree of absolute decoupling. But as far as the planet is concerned, it's just relative decoupling that we have, we, we've managed to do. What does this suggest? This suggests that the problem is perhaps the continuing growing scale of our economic activity. If GDP continues to grow, our primary power use will continue to grow alongside it. Now we may be able technologically to electrify our economies, to move towards renewables. Maybe some of you would like to move back towards nuclear power or that if, if, if you want to go in that direction, that takes time uh, to do as well. But the trouble is it's much harder to do that in a global economy which keeps growing rapidly over time and it may not be a feasible thing to do. So we end up in 2022 rapidly eating into our natural capital. We end up with a growing biodiversity crisis. And of course, people are beginning to understand that global warming is not just about the average uh, temperature increasing over time. It's about increasingly extreme climate events, one after another. What Bill Mitchell in a blog post the other day talk, talked about called uh, polycrisis, compounding on each other. And if they were to continue in the next decade or two, threatening our ability to provision ourselves and provide a quality of life that we used to, let alone improve our quality of life. As for emissions, yes, everybody is talking about moving towards net zero emissions. Well, you know, we've been talking about this, politicians, environmental scientists, especially economists, since the early 1990s. And so far, we have utterly failed. The record year for global carbon dioxide emissions ever will be 2022. So far, we have made no progress whatsoever in moving towards net zero carbon dioxide emissions. And I would also, uh, uh, at, at this stage, I'd like to urge you at some stage to go onto the website of the Geological Survey of Finland. There is a great piece of research there by Simon Michaud, which explains some of the things I was saying before. It's really very difficult to see how, particularly if we continue to pursue growthism as our overriding objective, as far as policy is concerned, um, we'll be able to transition quickly enough to renewables to allow ourselves um, without making some, uh, 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 what to my mind are implausible assumptions about technological advances or geoengineering uh, uh, to uh, zero net carbon emissions to retain a stable climate. Every year, while carbon emissions are positive, we are adding, you know, we're familiar with stock flow analysis in MMT from Godley and Loire and all that, but here's another application of stock flow analysis. As we put more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into our environment, then concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up. When I was in my 20s, uh, we used to say, that, or people used to say, that a concentration of about 350 parts per million was a safe concentration, consistent with global warming of no more than about one degree Celsius. Um, nobody talks about that anymore because we've gone far past it. Uh, it. What people tend to say now is that if we go from 350 to eventually 450, and we're, we're en route to getting to there, uh, in say 15 years time, if things continue as they are at the moment, if we don't get the promised and very rapid reductions in carbon dioxide emissions, well, if 350 uh, uh, parts per million was uh, alarm bells, 450 parts per million would be potentially catastrophic as far as global warming is concerned. That's what the climate scientists, including some quite well-known ones who have now joined the Extinction Rebellion approach to uh, protesting about these issues are saying. 
Um, this is uh, data drawn from uh, the IPCC um, scientific report that came out last year. Um, I don't want to dwell on this for too long, apart from to say that if we want, according to this data, a 50% likelihood of meeting the uh, Paris climate change commitment, then you know, we've not got much more than 10 years worth of emissions left at the current level of emissions, depending on the assumptions you make about uh, non-carbon dioxide emissions of, 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 of greenhouse gases. Uh, that's very difficult to do. We're getting to the point where that would involve going from circumstances where carbon dioxide emissions are growing every year to reducing them by something like, well, close to 10% per annum every year, year after year, if we were to bring that about. Um, that's essentially not going to happen. So if we put aside unlikely uh, scientific advances, 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming is gone. The 1.7 degree, still non-catastrophic figure has not gone. It seems much more achievable. And two degrees of global warming based on this data looks very achievable indeed. I mean, even if we could reduce our emissions by something like 3% per annum and just keep doing that. Difficult to do in a rapidly growing global economy, but if, if we could do that, then we could, we could meet that carbon budget. The problem is, would you get on a plane and fly to Australia if somebody told you there was a 50% chance the plane was going to crash? No, of course you wouldn't. Why do they talk about 50% or 66% likelihoods? Because when you talk about 90% likelihoods, the data looks very different and much less encouraging. In fact, if you, and it was a, a former uh, leading uh, executive of the coal industry that pointed this out to me and some other people. If you take a 90% likelihood of keeping global warming below two, two degrees, we have already used up our carbon budget. It's too late to do that. The issue then, of course, is that once you get to two degrees Celsius of global warming or beyond it, environmental tipping points become far more likely. We are reading all the time more and more stories about the erosion of Arctic summer ice that may have a knock-on effect as far as Atlantic circulation is concerned, which may have a knock-on effect as far as the weather, the climate, the local climate over the Amazon turning the Amazon from a carbon sink into a net emitter of, car emitter of carbon dioxide. And why this is risky is because if we do, if we do tip these tipping points, then we could lose control of our climate system. And then we have a far less hospitable future to deal with than, than we would like. So we need to end. Grocers. Um, I not necessarily say that gross domestic product in high income countries has to be has to shrink. I am saying that the pursuit of continued economic growth as without even thinking about it, the be all and end all objective of managing our economies has got to be abandoned. Don Alameda is the lead author of the Limits to Growth report, which came out in the early 70s, soon after we passed the Earth's biocapacity in terms of our ecological footprint, put it very nicely on one occasion. Growth of what, and why, and for whom, and who pays the cost? Well, you know, growth so far has been largely at the benefit of the global north. Who has paid the cost? Uh, the overwhelming majority, almost all climate-related deaths so far have been in the global south. How much is enough? How are we going to manage our economies in the future? That's where we get from Stephanie Kelton's Deficits That Matter to Kate Raworth's Donut Economics, her donut model, the nine planetary boundaries that Rockstrom and Stefan and others identified in 2009 are listed around the outside of Kate Raworth's donut. If we are inside those boundaries, we are living sustainably, but what Kate of course, pointed out is that if you're at the center 
of that circle. You'll be living within all those boundaries, but you'll be living a life of poverty and destitution. We have to use up some of the Earth's resources to provide people with food, water, energy, housing, income and work. So the problem in terms of future economic development, and if you are a young person learning about modern monetary theory, this is your problem. I'm afraid we're passing it on to you largely. The problem is, how do we manage our economies in the future to ensure that whatever set of social foundations we might identify, and Kate's measures were based quite closely on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We can meet those social foundations for the great mass of people, for virtually everybody, while living within our ecological ceiling. That is the challenge for the next generation. You understand modern monetary theory, you understand the appropriate role for the government, the government budget to play within the economy. You understand that the government's not going to run out of its own currency. The government should be using monetary sovereignty in the years to come to promote the public purpose. What is the public purpose? To meet the social foundations of a good quality of life while not staying outside our ecological ceiling. And of course, making the investments that we need to make in the years to come is likely to involve uh, a significant growth in real GDP for a time, but we need to be aware that we are eating in to our natural capital. We're making investments now to allow us to live within, to restore that natural capital later on. These are the kind of issues we need to think about. How well are countries doing at the moment? Um, research by, um, Kate is, is linked to Oxford University, but research by colleagues of Kate, the Ecolo ecological economists at the University of Leeds and the well-known LSE anthropologist, Jason Hickel, has investigated this and most recently in a paper from this year um, in order to have data which is comparable for almost all countries around the world they've had to vary um, their the, the data that they use for social foundations and ecological ceiling a little bit from what you find in Kate's book but it's the same basic idea on the horizontal axis we have biophysical boundaries transgressed per capita for most of the countries in the world. On the vertical axis, we have the number of social foundations achieved. A developed economy would be in the top left-hand corner of this chart, where you can see that donut. To get there, to quote Bill Mitchell's blog, the organization of economic activity, our patterns of consumption and conduct of economic policy must all change radically. All countries need to change. Put it another way, there are no developed economies at the moment, but not all in the same ways. The high income economies like Australia, where I live, they are meeting almost all the social thresholds of a good quality of life. And to the extent that they are not, generally this is related to a problem for the distribution of income and wealth. So the problem there is to maintain and even improve the quality of life for the majority of people while moving within our biophysical boundaries. In a country like Australia, I think that inevitably, if only we could get to this tipping point, this social and political tipping point, involves public ownership of the energy system, of public transport, um, uh, uh, of uh, public services in general. And even though I'm working with a private university, I include in that, um, well, a, a decommodified public services, which means free education, including higher education, but it involves a variety of other things too. Different countries will have different ways of achieving it, but that's the problem in those countries. The countries in orange here, well, they're countries that are not on a per capita basis transgressing um, many of their biophysical boundaries. They are living largely sustainably, ecologically speaking, but the problem for those countries is to improve the quality of people's lives while continuing to live sustainably. And that relies on a transfer of real resources and technology from the high income countries, among other things. And then there's the third group of countries which are not living ecologically sustainably, but are also not meeting 
the social thresholds. And those countries tend to be countries with very high levels of inequality. But everybody needs to move towards the top left-hand corner. And we somehow have to do this on a global level. It's not just negotiations relating to carbon emissions. It's all those planetary boundaries. It's all the elements contributing towards our ecological footprint while dealing with the, um, the consequences of colonialism and neo-colonialism and global injustice, which means so many people, the people who are suffering the consequences of, of, of climate change at the moment have not enjoyed the benefits of the economic activity, which the exploitation of fossil fuels and the materials we've taken out of our biosphere has allowed the rest of us to do. So I need to hurry up and finish. What's the first thing we need to do? We need to stop talking about growth in real GDP as being something which is good in itself. It is at the most a means to an end, but we need then to start asking questions like the questions Don Meadows used to ask. Um, what's the cost of that growth? And who bears that cost? So we need to change the goal from growth to development, we can use a panel of indicators, as with Jason Hickel and his co-authors, in order to measure this. Or if you're going to use the approach which my close friend and colleague, Phil Lorne, and some other ecological economists have pioneered, then you can argue that the genuine progress indicator is a, a metric of economic success, of the impact of economic activity on human well-being which is far superior to GDP in that it at least attempts to identify both the benefits and the costs, economic and social of uh, economic activity and to subtract a measure of the environmental cost, the environmental impact of that activity. So you are looking at a measure of the net benefit to society or, or, of economic activity over time and maximizing the genuine progress indicator rather than maximizing GDP um, would give policymakers more of an incentive to introduce those policies which are consistent with finding the safe and just, just space for humanity, the ring of Kate Rowers donor. So either of those two approaches is fine. We need to guarantee everybody economic security and the opportunity to contribute to social provisioning. A job guarantee is important in ecological economics as it is in, in modern monetary theory. We need to fund, and of course, monetary sovereign governments are the institutions which are in a position to fund the very large scale investments that we need to make in renewable energy, in green infrastructure, in all the things that we need to do in order to transition to a sustainable future economy. We need to rethink issues like the working week and the retirement age and what we value. One way or another, we need to adopt binding cumulative quantitative limits for all planetary boundaries. Otherwise, we really don't have much of a future. And where do we find the money? Well, there was a... Uh, I wrote a chapter for a book that was published at the beginning of this year, Sustainability in the New Economics, Synthesizing Ecological Economics and Modern Monetary Theory. There's a chapter from Steve Keen in there as well, by the way, edited by Stephen Williams and Rod Taylor, which, which discuss this um, more generally. Who needs to fund it? High income, monetary sovereign governments from the global north. How can we pay for a Green New Deal? That is, uh, um, MMT authors have, have tackled that issue very well indeed already, but it's not just about a national Green New Deal. It's about a global Green New Deal, where we are about maximizing human well-being while living within our planetary boundaries. And this is something that I think is going to happen to you. We are going to, over the next decade, experience a series of uh, climate uh, and potentially other ecological crises that are going to make it more and more obvious to people that business as usual 
is not an option, that the approach to managing these issues, which has been put forward and promoted by neoclassical economists, is not good enough, and that we need to try a different approach. And I think at some stage, um, I hope at some stage, that people with a thorough understanding of modern monetary theory, uh, of what is important to human well-being, of um, ecological economics, of our planetary boundaries, if you like, are going to basically be in a situation where when, when politicians have tried everything else, they'll be turning to us. And we need to be ready to meet that challenge. And in a sense, it's the same old MMT challenge. We're not going to be short of US dollars. We're not going to be short of euros. We're not going to be short of Australian dollars. We're not going to be short of Japanese yen. We are going to be short of the real resources we need to improve human well being over time. And while there is still time, avoid social collapse. Finding the money should be the easy part. I'm just an economics teacher. I'm not a great researcher or anything. So I'm just doing what I thought it was useful for me to do. And so with our chief executive, Gabrielle Bond, and someone who is a really good uh, economics researcher, as I've mentioned before, Australia's leading ecological economist, Phil Lorne, we eventually managed to persuade Torrance University to let us offer a global online master's degree in the economics of sustainability, which we have been working like mad people to get ready in time for the first intake of students, which is the beginning of next month. And I hope that people coming through this program, and I hope that there will be more programs like this, the more competition we get, the better around the world as time goes by. I hope people coming through this program are going to transform policy institutions, uh, um, uh, business, finance. Some of them will work in not-for-profits. Maybe eventually some of them will even overthrow mainstream or neoclassical economics departments. And we can get on and deal with the problems which we undoubtedly face in the next century with tools which are fit for those problems. And neoclassical economics, as I said, was misleading in the last century, but it's dangerous in this one. The economics which dominated our narrative in the 20th century is not fit for purpose in the 21st. And it's up to people like you to replace it. And that's the end of the talk. So thank you very much, Professor Hale, for this exciting and thrilling lecture. Uh, so now let me open uh, the Q&A session. So if you have questions, please come over here so, uh, first and ask you. Stephen, hi, good evening to you in uh, Adelaide. My name is Freddie Sharp from Sydney. I'm- um, Oh, hello. Actually, joining your program as your first intake, one of your first intakes. I recognised your name. Yes, <laughs> and my good looks, I hope. Um, the uh, question I have is about the adoption of the language net zero by 2050. And that's become widespread as a target to be understood. It's the wrong target, surely. It has to be gross zero by 2050. Net zero means we simply don't keep adding to the atmosphere. And the Earth can sequester through the land sector huge volumes of atmospheric CO2. But net zero means that ability is used to offset pollution. So shouldn't we have the language of net pollution, but zero pollution by 2050 and net sequestration? Otherwise, we're too late. Thank you. Thanks. That's a great question, uh, Timothy. Yeah, I agree with you. The only way I disagree with you is I think 2050 is an irrelevant figure. Um, I think that's far too late. Um, I think that... Um, the 2050 figure, when you look at IPCC reports, um, scenarios which are consistent with us uh, keeping global warming below two degrees with net zero by 2050, they very often, they're either extremely optimistic about, about our ability to cut emissions. So the assumption is always that we're going to start cutting them next year. 
They make that every year. And, and we never get around to doing that. Uh, and the, the second way in which they often, um, or most of those scenarios are, are unrealistic is they make assumptions about carbon capture and storage, which uh, are, are, are on the optimistic side. So I am with climate scientists like Kevin Anderson and earth system scientists like Will Stephan, who are more likely to talk about um, zero emissions by the early 2040s or even the late 2030s. If you seriously wanted to aim for uh, 1.7 degrees of global warming, I, you can tell I'm not an expert in this area. I'm really just, uh, I wish I had Phil with me because he is, but uh, I'm trying to justify, I suppose, why we are trying to cha change, and it seems a very arrogant thing to do, but we're trying to change economics education. I think every economics degree should be centered on ecological economics and modern monetary theory. We are offering this program, which would be great to see you on Freddie, um, because uh, there are a few places where modern monetary theory makes a significant part of the, of the uh, curriculum. There are a few more places where you can study ecological economics, but uh, as far as we're aware, there aren't any places at the moment where you can train in both. And I think they're both extraordinarily important elements of an economics for the, for the 21st century. But yes, I agree with you, Freddie. Thank you, Phil. Um, Hi, um, my name is Amos and um, I wanted Hi. to ask, uh, you discussed uh, wealth and income inequality, and uh, assuming that uh, trade unions are an important or major instrument in reducing inequality, I want to ask if there's an internal conflict or contradiction between the goal of reducing CO emissions or greenhouse gas emissions and uh, maintaining powerful trade union movement as uh, Union as labeled today is based mostly in carbon based industries. I don't think that there is no, and in fact, I am not only a member of a trade union, but I'm very much in favor of a powerful trade union movement. Uh, I think that, I mean, in Australia, for example, uh, I think obviously we're big exporters of uh, coal and natural gas. Too, and I yes, I believe that uh, we need to go through a planned reduction in scale of those industries. And as far as thermal coal is concerned, it needs to be phased out quite quickly. Um, I, when we had our conference in Adelaide two years ago, the leader of the coal miners union in Australia, um, Tony Mayer, uh, was at the conference, was a speaker at the conference. And um, I think that um, people are rapidly becoming aware of what we need to do in the future. And then it's important, first of all, that um, communities, for example, coal communities, uh, they need to see that there is a good future for them beyond the coal industry. People need to see that they're gonna have employment opportunities and people need to be compensated. We can't uh, pass the transition costs on to a small group of people. Coal miners are not responsible for the uh, emissions which result from the burning of, of coal as a fossil fuel. So I think discussions with trade unions uh, and trade union leaders have a very important part to play in a transition to a sustainable future and we can't do it without them but of course in the long run they have children and grandchildren too so I think when we talk about uh, ecological constraints we're just talking about reality we have to find a way to have honest conversations with people and I think this is beginning to happen now very slowly um, we have 
that's why we had Tony Mayer at the conference. Um, it, it, the, it, we uh, got on really well. He was very interested in the idea of a federal job guarantee. He understands that the coal industry is going to close between now and 2050. The Coal Miners Union understand that perfectly well. And then it's about looking after their members and the communities in which their members live. People have to be offered, however you do it, uh, uh, a, a, a future where their standard of living is maintained uh, and where they have employment opportunities, decent employment opportunities. It's not easy to do, but uh, it's, it's a, a vital part of the transition. So no, I don't, I don't see that there is necessarily a conflict. I think trade unions are a vitally important part of a transition to uh, a just uh, future where we are living sustainably, people are having a good quality of life. People are still in employment, but they're not doing the same things they were doing before. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my name is Utz Gundok. I'm, um, I'm wondering, you were showing this uh, graph where you showed to us that, uh, first of all, the major fossil fuel extracting countries are really on the wrong side. And I wonder whether you know about countries or movements or political parties who are um, somehow taking up these challenges which you have been describing and maybe if there are, um, what we could learn from them. Okay, as I said, I'm not an expert. Kate Raworth will tell you that if you wanted to identify a country which was, uh, um, which was doing better in terms of pursuing a sustainable uh, uh, a future with a circular economy and a regenerative approach to nature, the best candidate is probably Costa Rica. But I can't claim to tell you all about that. I know there are some videos about, uh, about, about that that you can look at online. In terms of political parties, um, I reluctantly have been in recent years a member of a political party. Um, uh, uh, they have flaws like all other political parties do. And uh, this term doesn't mean the same thing in every country around the world either. But I am a member, albeit a non-active one, of the Australian Greens. I give them a membership fee. Um, the main reason for that really is that they continue to argue for targets for reducing carbon dioxide emissions in Australia, which are consistent with the science. We have a better government in Australia now than we had earlier this year. We have more challenging, a more challenging target than we had before. Um, but uh, we still have very limited policy decisions to, to promote a, a more rapid transition to lower carbon emissions. We still have a government that talks about um, uh, buying carbon credits internationally. And I really don't think, uh, I, I don't, as, as far as I'm aware, um, uh, the, uh, that system is not one that I trust, let's say. Uh, and we've got a government with a, 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 a target for from 2005 to 2030, 40-something uh, percent reduction in carbon emissions, including those that come from uh, land use changes, um, we need to be 75% or more in Australia and other countries. Otherwise, there's no way we are heading for 1.7 degrees of global warming. We're heading for 2.7 or more. And even quite conservative climate scientists will tell you that. Um, so I think everyone, depending where you are in the world, you need to look for political parties or politicians to support and to get behind who are prepared to argue for policies which are consistent with, at least as far as climate change is concerned, with, uh, with, um, with the science. And in Australia, the Liberal Party 
the, our conservatives certainly aren't but even the labor party even the government we have now they've sort of taken half a step in the direction of sustainability but they've got much further to go they're being pressured on that by the greens and others and while the greens continue to pressure them on that then i'm going to keep paying my membership fees to the australian greens I can't say the Australian Greens always talk as though they understand modern monetary theory, however, I have to say. So also from you, very thank you very much for the, the presentation. Um, and also I think very important to, to connect the, the ecological transition to MMT, because I think rather from going of a narrative of scarcity and abs abstinence, uh, towards a, a prosperous future for everyone, I think, because that wins in the end majorities, which we need uh, to, to get the, um, the, the planet, and then well, not the planet, but us surviving. Um, but still, I'm wondering, because I think the transition for the industrialized world is already hard enough, but we also have to move up plenty of people living in extreme poverty. So how confident are you that we can are able to lift these people up while remaining in the planetary boundaries? Um, if Bernie Sanders was the US president, if Stephanie Kelton was the US Treasury Secretary, if, uh, if we had uh, Steve Keen and Bill Mitchell involved in the Australian government, I'd be a lot more confident than I am at the moment. Uh, I don't think that it is too late. Um, from an you know from an economics point of view or from a from a climate science point of view i sometimes think it's too late from a political point of view because i'll be honest with you i can't see um it's it's not going to happen tomorrow the political tipping point and if a republican wins the next us presidential election i'll be very pessimistic indeed and uh, my colleague at Modern Money Lab, Gabrielle Bond, already is on the streets getting arrested, um, gluing herself to the road. I'll be doing that. Give it five years. And if we have not seen major political changes, especially in North America, um, and the Biden government, of course, is a great improvement on the Trump one, but um, they're going to go back to a Republican administration, or they may do. Um, uh, so how optimistic am I? I don't have the expertise to say. I am confident that if people like Stephanie Kelton and Kate Rowers and Mariana Mazzucato and economists like that had more influence and we had genuinely progressive governments in high income countries that also understood and were prepared to tell the truth about the injustices from historical and present day colonialism and to look for just as we should have a treaty in Australia with our First Nations people here. So the global north, there should be a global treaty for with uh, uh, those countries that have suffered the consequences of, uh, of colonialism historically. Could we do all those things? Could we build a future where everybody had a good quality of life and we were living sustainably. Yes. Um, will we? I don't know the answer to that question. That doesn't mean I'm going to the other cat catastrophic extreme that we're going to be faced with social collapse. But it does mean that we are going to have, I'm sure we're going to have uh, 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 significantly more global warming than we have already. We're going to go um, or probably well beyond two degrees of global warming. There are going to be tens of millions of climate related deaths and other deaths relating to uh, uh, indirectly to issues like a loss of biodiversity. And as always historically, the great cost is going to be on low income people in the global south. And it's our responsibility. I can see some of you are young and you're European it's your responsibility to get involved in politics and economics and do something about this. Okay, so
any other questions. So let me uh, let me conclude. Uh, and thank you very much, Steven, uh, for your time and for the talk. Uh, we hope to see you next year, probably. Uh, okay, so uh, that was it. And uh, please uh, send me your presentation because I, I think I don't have it. Uh, yet. Absolutely. And thank you very much, everybody, for listening. I hope I haven't bored everybody to death. And uh, thanks to the organisers of, uh, of this summer school. It's, a, it, it's really a really important ongoing contribution to MMT education. And uh, I just want to say to everybody, what you're learning now is going to place you in a position in five or 10 years time when uh, uh, everybody in the world is going to want to know about what you know now. And the supply of that expertise is going to be very limited. You're, you, are, you are important. People like you are going to be very important in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. So I wish you all the best. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summer school and thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.